Living shorelines are shoreline erosion control methods that include a suite of options and use native materials such as marsh plantings and oyster shells. They can also include stone sills and wooden breakwaters. Unlike bulkheads or other vertical erosion control structures, living shorelines maintain existing connections between upland, intertidal, and aquatic areas. These connections are necessary to protect water quality, ecosystem services, and coastal habitats. Dr. Carolyn Curran, a researcher at the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration Lab in Beaufort, explains more about coastal habitats, ecosystem services, and marsh ecology. So the North Carolina coastal habitats that you're going to encounter along the shoreline include these. We have salt marshes in the upper intertidal, and then as you go down through the intertidal, you get into um, oyster reefs, um, sand flats and mud flats just off, can occur just offshore that, and then seagrasses or submerged aquatic vegetation are also described or below that. All of these habitats occur sometimes in a continuum, sometimes you'll find all of them together. Um, all of them can be part of a living shoreline approach. All of them have their own role in terms of both shoreline stabilization and some of the other ecosystem functions. How many of you have heard the term ecosystem services? But it's this idea that these habitats kind of just do these things that we value. So they provide fisheries habitat, they provide habitat for clams, shrimp, um, crabs, they provide really important nursery habitat for um, the larval fish that come in here and grow to adult fish. They provide shoreline stabilization functions. They hold that shoreline together. They can attenuate wave energy. They provide great um, opportunities for recreation. Some people just like to go out and look at them. They're aesthetically pleasing. And they also have these other functions in terms of water quality. They trap sediments. They process um, nutrients and can remove um, too much nitrogen from the system. Uh, we've talked a little bit about they can actually sequester carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and bury it in their sediments and so thus can help mitigate greenhouse, greenhouse gas accumulation in the atmosphere. So they do all these things. They just do them, but we value them. And so we call them ecosystem services that these habitats provide and that we gain when we incorporate these habitats into our, into our shorelines. So, it, so one of the things that I want to point out when we see these fringing marshes is that a lot of the ecosystem services that I just mentioned, they happen primarily at the marsh edge. And so even a fairly narrow marsh, you don't need hundreds of meters of marsh to get a lot of these ecosystem services. A lot of them occur at the, it with, can occur within a very narrow 10, 20 meter wide marsh. For example, there have been a lot of research that's shown the, fr the fish and shrimp utilization of a marsh is primarily at the marsh edge. That's where you catch the most. That's where they, they tend to occupy the most. As I'll show you in a minute, wave attenuation happens at that marsh edge. 10 or 20 meters of marsh can be very effective. Sediment trapping happens primarily at the marsh edge. So let's talk a little bit about wave attenuation, especially in terms of shoreline attenuation this, or shoreline stabilization. This is one of the most important functions um, of, of, the, of the marsh. So this picture up here is from the marsh you'll see later today right on our island. And there's, as again, as I mentioned, there's been a lot of research to demonstrate this. About half of the incoming wave energy is reduced within the first 10 feet of the salt marsh. Salt marsh grows up into the water column. It's, it's um, you know, cylinders that are pretty woody, and they give with that wave, and they absorb a lot of that wave energy. You can get over 90% of the incoming wave attenuation in the first 20 meters of, of marsh. There's also a lot of research that demonstrates clearly that wave energy reduction increases with plant biomass. Makes sense, but there's a lot of data out there. As you increase above ground biomass, you increase that wave energy reduction. However, the one thing we have to think about is this relationship between the plant canopy height and the tide. So in the bottom graph, there's low tide. So there's the water column right there at the, at the base of the plant. And this is when you can get erosion. If you've got waves happening now, it's going to be scouring that beach right there in front of the marsh. As the tide comes in, now you've got a tide. Now you've got the water column up through the, through the marsh canopy. That's when it's most effective. It's really going to knock down the waves at this point. When, however, you get a storm surge or water level heights that are double the plant canopy height. At this point, 
that, that marsh is no longer attenuating that wave energy. It becomes a drag coefficient as the storm surge moves across the marsh, but it's not really attenuating wave, wave, wave energy at this point. So this is, um, this is a wave coming into a living shoreline on Pyvers Island, and you can see those plants flattening in the foreground. And in the background, they're still pretty erect, and those are some pretty big waves, and it's just laying back and absorbing all that energy and really reducing the energy that's actually hitting the shoreline behind there. We and, we and others have shown that marshes do grow sediment volume over time, that storm events, particularly hurricanes, are often a source of sediment to the marsh rather than an erosion event, that marshes are able to keep up with sea level by this gradual accumulation of sediment on the, on the surface as well as their below ground production, and that this, that, and that this sediment increase, this increase in sediment volume, facilitates the carbon sequestration ability of salt marshes. So let's now talk about um, shoreline hardening and why some of the adverse impacts of shoreline hardening and why we're interested in going to, towards a living shoreline approach. So this slide just shows you some of the approaches that have been used from seawalls um, to bulkheads to uh, groins or jetties, riprap revetments, breakwaters. There's not a lot of coastal habitat that we've just been talking associated with any of these structures. They don't coexist well with the maintenance of those coastal habitats. So what happens when you harden a structure? What do you lose? Well, this is that, you know, a cartoon version of what we'd like to see. We have the seagrass out here. We have the tidal marsh here. One of the most important points that I want to make about this, these natural systems is that just that shallow water in and of itself is really important. It's a refuge for those small larval juvenile fish to get away from the large predators. And so I think what's the statistic is 90% of the commercial fisheries in North Carolina are estuarine dependent. They spawn offshore. They come in as larval fish and they need that's really the key part of their life cycle, is getting from larvals to juveniles to adults. And what they need is just shallow water. And so this is maintained in this kind of condition, is this shallow water refuge. When we harden the shoreline and we introduce a bulkhead, we lose our, we lose our vegetated intertidal. The waves are no longer absorbed by the marshes I mentioned earlier. Now they're hitting that bulkhead and they're bouncing back out. And they're scouring that bottom they're deepening that sediment, so we're losing that shallow water refuge, and we're losing all the, the habitat value for fish of that shoreline. The other point is these bulkheads are put in at or above mean high water. That's the regulatory. You have to put it at mean high water or above. But these changes that are happening are all occurring below mean high water, which is a public trust resource. So we're losing that, that we're losing that ability to trap sediments, we're losing the vegetation, we're losing that fish habitat, we're losing some of the biogeochemistry that occurs in those marsh habitats because of the introduction of these bulkheads into this. Even though the bulkhead is put above the mean high water line, the loss of public trust resources is happening below the mean high water line. So what can we do to try and mitigate both the loss of habitats by these shoreline hardening approaches I described? So this is where We've come into the living, this idea of living shorelines. Here's another definition. I don't know if it's the same one um, Whitney used or not. There's, this is kind of an evolving idea of what living shorelines include. But basically, we want to include vegetation and or other soft elements, in, possibly in combination with a harder shoreline structure, maybe just an oyster reef, maybe, maybe a rock sill for added stability where you need it. We want to maintain that continuity of the natural land water continuum and reduce erosion for the property, the waterfront property owners, while providing habitat value. And I think this is a really important point, increasing resilience. These systems are more resilient in many cases than are the hardened shorelines. So we want to enhance coastal resiliency with this approach. Living shorelines are not a one-size-fits-all solution but rather a suite of options designed to fit a site's conditions, including wave energy, fetch, water depth, tidal range, and existing habitats. Steve Trowell, a field representative in the Division of Coastal Management's Washington office, shares what site conditions he looks at when designing a living shoreline. In, in 
looking at a site and assessing it, is it a suitable site? Because not all sites are suitable for a living shoreline, but one of the first things that I want to look for when I walk onto a site and a property owner is interested in doing a living shoreline is, is what, what habitats are there and what, what aquatic resources are present. And, and designing a living shoreline, we, we don't want to impact these habitats too much in a negative way. And, and things I look for, one of the main things in being in this Abmol Pamlico area is, is that submerged aquatic vegetation. It's a very valuable habitat. It's, two, is, again, is your shellfish resources, like your oyster beds. Uh, you know, we want to enhance that habitat. We don't want to bury it. But when I'm walking onto a site, what am I looking at? I'm looking at, at how much fetch and how that shoreline is oriented. Predominant wind directions in, in eastern North Carolina are northeast, southwest. We get strong wind energies as well from the northwest, and we get frontal boundary passages. The next thing is water depths. And the shallower the water, the, the more that wave is going to have drag on it. It's going to cause it to break if it's shallow enough. And so in designing a seal structure, uh, if it is shallow and that wave's breaking before it gets to the shoreline, and that's the tricky part is if, if we're on a high energy situation, the design and uh, we're going to have to use a, a wave attenuation structure, is how small of a structure can we get away with? And factors to consider is your water depths, and then of course your tidal range. There's different types of wave attenuation structures, and there's different types of living shorelines. You know, there's, there are opportunities out there where you can just plant a living shoreline and you don't have to use a wave attenuation structure. As Steve mentions, not all living shorelines require a sill or wave attenuation structure. Aaron Fleckenstein with the North Carolina Coastal Federation shares an example of using only marsh plantings for shoreline stabilization. So this is a site... Um, in Currituck Sound, this is the Army Corps of Engineers Duck Research Station right behind their facility. And you can see that the shoreline was experiencing some erosion. There was concern, excuse me, there was some concern about you know, impacts to the roadbed as well as the infrastructure that was in place. And they decided, since they were the research station, that they were going to experiment with shoreline stabilization. And they went out and just repeatedly um, planted marsh grasses for over a number of years and eventually the marsh grasses took hold on some of those sand flats and then started to fill in and create more of a contiguous marsh. So this was with no grading, no fill was brought in, just repeated marsh grass plantings over a period of time. Now they were willing to, to wait for that stabilization to occur and like I said they were also willing to um, experiment and try something out before going towards more of a hardened structure. <coughs> if the slopes and elevation are not adequate for just marsh plantings alone, you can consider regrading or bringing in some sediment and, and fill. But um, there is a concern with bringing in fill and, and the possible introduction of invasive species. So really trying to work with the native sediment as much as possible is, is definitely always best. Biologs which are made of natural fibers, are an option for areas with low wave energy. They are designed to biodegrade over time and give your shoreline temporary protection while your marsh plantings begin to establish. Tracy Scrabble with the North Carolina Coastal Federation provides more details. When you see these heavily used in Chesapeake Bay Area, you most often see them with a little stone at the base of these. What you're talking about is something that's sort of at the soft end of structural approaches. It's a it's a cocoa mat fiber um, that is designed to, to biodegrade over time. Depending on the energy conditions, it can biodegrade in about 15 minutes or it can biodegrade over several years. Um, we've got a project that we did, excuse me, um, where it was, we used it because there was no room to grade a bank back and so we used it in place of a bulkhead and there's still remnants of that 10 years later. Uh, it doesn't hold up as well with wave energy of any kind or in saltwater situations. You see these more used in freshwater, but I think Maryland and Virginia has done a pretty good job of deciding that where you can get more life out of these is where you put stone at the base and these are two uh, stakes that hold it into place. They're shore parallel. If a sill is needed at your living shoreline, Steve Trowell shares design guidance for these structures. These are some of the design criteria, things that you might want to think about in designing, designing for instance, a sheet pile seal 
Sheet pile seal does have some advantages in that it does require less of a footprint, so we're not covering as much of that shallow bottom habitat that Carolyn spoke to. Um, probably not as good in, in high wave energy situations, but things to consider when designing a, a uh, sheet pile seal is one, um, to have one inch gaps, a minimum of one inch gaps that meet or equal uh, one inch per linear foot. And I know if you're using different materials, say for instance, if you're designing a sheet pile seal and you're using vinyl, a lot of times those sheets are 18 inches wide. Uh, there's, there's more than one way to accomplish that, that, that gap. And the purpose of that gap is to allow water circulation and, and aquatic life movement. You can either uh, every other foot and a half provide a bigger opening, more say more so than an inch, or I've seen them cut holes in the, the sheets themselves that allow that water to circulate. Um, you want your seal sections to overlap. Uh, this is a general, and this is following what is, what's in our general permit, which went, underwent a, a lot of review from the different regulatory and, and uh, resource agencies to come up with that permit condition. But this is just a general design concept to think, especially in your smaller projects, you want to leave an opening every 100 feet. Uh, if we're on a high energy situation or on a longer stretch of shoreline, we might could get away with uh, doing longer sections, uh, but maybe having bigger openings, but a minimum of a, a five foot opening and, and the overlap, generally we don't want to see any more than about 10 feet. And again, the purpose of that is to allow water circulation, aquatic life movement in and around the seal itself. And then the height. Um, again, you're going to want to think about your, your, your tides, your water depths, and what kind of wave you're going to see. But again, it too, we want it to be as, as low as, as we can possibly get away with. A general uh, thing to think about is six inches or less above the normal water level, maybe as, as high as a foot if we're in a uh, high energy situation. But to remember, uh, a vertical structure like that, you're going to want that thing to go under water in a big storm. It's, uh, it's, it's not going to fare as well as, as an uh, the other seal structure like rock. Here's an example uh, of what one looks like when they're constructed. You see the gaps in the boards. They're built similar to a bulkhead where they have a soldier piling, and then they build a frame with a top and a bottom whaler, and then the sheets are, are attached or screwed to the, uh, to the whaler system. Rip wrap or oyster bag seals, it's similar to the sheet pile seal, we like to see a, a five foot opening as a general concept every 100 feet. Um, again, if we're in a higher energy situation or if the, there's a, something driving, site conditions are driving a longer section, uh, you can compensate by putting in a, a bigger openings, again, to compensate for the longer sections. Uh, there's several ways to achieve that opening, and again, the purpose of these openings is to allow aquatic life movement in and by, around the seal, and uh, they may be achieved by either dropping the height of the seal down, you can uh, overlap the seal similar to a sheet pile seal, or you can have gaps that are baffled either offshore or inshore by a smaller seal. Again, seal height is going to be driven by wave energy, you know, your shoreline orientation and your water depths. A seal height of six inches per foot above the normal water mean high water is desirable. Higher energy sites may require a seal height to exceed a foot. And again, you know, we're trying to build the smallest footprint, put the smallest structures we can to avoid those unnecessary impacts. And uh, so your side slopes, we don't want to, you don't want to put anything out there more than, any steeper than one and a half to one vertical with a two to, two to one more desirable. And, and in designing those things too, if we are in fact putting in a, a stone seal, you know, your, your landward slope can be steeper than your, your, uh, your seaward side, again, to help reduce that footprint. This is an example of a seal that was done out of mall, and it's done with an overlap design. This was a, a vertical escarpment here that they armored at the toe, and then across the uh, opening here, they did an overlap design. That, it's about five foot uh, in between toe to toe on that seal there. This is an example of a, a oyster bag seal that was done, and the baffle it was it was done with a baffle. The baffle to open here is the open. The baffle was put in on the back side of the seal alignment, and again this was done out of oyster bags. This is one where the baffle was put offshore, 
rather large structure here that fetches the entire Pamlico Sound. And this opening here is about 30 feet. Here's a seal structure with a drop down, no baffle. They just drop the seal down to allow that water flow. Tracy Scrabble and Aaron Fleckenstein share additional examples of living shorelines that incorporated sills. This is, a, again, a wooden sill. We used to call these wooden breakwaters, but in fact they are a form of a sill. And remember that a sill is that structure that's placed channelward of uh, where your marsh is growing or your marsh will be reestablished. And so again, this is the one that has the, the smallest footprint, if you will. Some uh, limitations in their use in terms of their ability to dissipate, um, but, but in the right location, these do a great job at low cost and low design. I really like this picture because it contrasts the difference between what's a wooden sill and what's a bulkhead. So you can see the bulkhead is placed right here at that upland interface, whereas the sill is placed just offshore, about 15, 20 feet offshore, and it is much lower profile than the bulkhead, so the waves are actually able to break over top, and you have the slope grading and marsh grass plantings that help to create that living habitat, that marsh interface. Another site on the Chowan River, also uh, in a brackish shoreline. This, was, uh, this is the uh, Wildlife Resources Commission boat ramp and parking lot in that location. This is an area where we had a huge amount of stormwater runoff from a he heavily used uh, parking lot that's way too close to the shoreline, so we're getting water quality issues in addition to a failing bulkhead. So it was a great opportunity to partner with Wildlife Resources to do something different. What we did was, and you can see here, we pulled out that old bulkhead uh, we regraded the shoreline, pulled it back towards the parking lot, so we wanted to put in a full riparian buffer here. This is an area where bald cypress used to be uh, growing. We had some old photos, and you can kind of see, and not, I mean, we did this project in 2005, 2004, 5, and by 2007, again, those same species that I just mentioned to you, um, the, the bulrushes, the uh, Zizaniopsis does really well in all of these environs. And uh, again, we got a really nice gradation right on up to the uh, parking lot. What I love about this is once again, um, oh, we also got a nice little stand of eelgrass. And this is not the first time we've seen this. This is not a shoreline where we saw eelgrass before, but it is a shoreline. Again, eelgrass is ephemeral. Um, but the quiet spaces behind these structures, we saw it at Columbia, we saw it here, I just saw it at um, Carteret Community College, which I'll show you. But we, so you can see a reintroduction of these uh, SAVs. Also, this is a case somebody mentioned about the openings. We do see erosion from funneled energy through these five foot gaps that we put in these structures to allow fish passage um, and circulation exchange. So what we did in this location, and I use this fairly regularly now, is a small section of a sill that is channel landward of the opening. It has to be no more than maybe half the height of a regular section of sill, and it just dissipates that energy so you don't see a big scour behind here. You could do the same thing with overlaps, but you're doubling the cost. There are other reasons why you wouldn't want to do that. So these work pretty well for us. But you can also see how mature the shoreline has gotten to be. Rock sills are common in many living shoreline designs. To prevent negative impacts to the adjacent uplands and wetlands, there are some construction best practices to keep in mind. The Division of Coastal Management's Steve Trowell shares some of these best practices. This was a major permit riprap seal that was done on Ockercoke, you know, just to ensure it teaches, uh, teaches whole, and so it was done out of granite. And uh, the stockpile site for this area or this project was here. The high ground, this is a high marsh here. It's vegetated with black needle rush, uh, three square, salt meadow hay. Uh, on the shore there was fringing, alternate flora, and then just stitching of spicata. And it was along the shoreline there, as you see along a lot of natural marshes that are, that are subject to a big fetch and that have a lot of sediment uh, in the near shore area, you end up with a sand berm, sand overwash berm, and these sand deposits that you see here, this wasn't a result of the construction that occurred, was due to uh, winter overwash and sand deposition due to that wave action. 
But again, just to summarize, this is where the stockpile was. I'm going to show you some more pictures of the site. The stockpile is the site. The staging area for the granite material was right here. The site was accessed at two points, one being here and, and one being here. And uh, this picture was taken just after the seal was constructed. The rock was moved from the stockpile by uh, rubber tire backhoe. Logging mats were laid to a, what we call a rock box. And uh, so this uh, rubber tire backhoe at the stockpile was loaded by a smaller excavator. So he handled each rock individually. In, in doing that, um, he didn't grab sediment in, in loading the bucket, uh, the front end loader on the rubber tire backhoe, and he never took the bottom layer out of the stockpile, and so that he was continually dumping on top of that rock layer, and, and we didn't get any subsidence or, or sediment that were taken as, you know, he could, it, by not removing the, the rock stockpile completely every, every time. And then the rock was moved to this rock box and dumped, and then a long reach excavator was used to place the rock. And using this long reach excavator, a lot of times it's more expensive. Not everybody has a, a, a long reach excavator. You may have to rent it, but it, he only had to move twice. And he was able to sit right here. It was about 150 feet of seal that was put in and he, and he only moved twice. So that reduced his time that it took to, to put the structure in and it also reduced the impacts on, on this marsh. And using the mats, of course, that's more expensive as well to have to use them, but again, it, it keeps it from uh, disturbing this wetland substrate and damaging what we're trying to enhance. And again, uh, he used a fabric to provide a footing for the, the uh, rock to sit on to, to reduce some su the subsidence, and there's gonna be some, but again, uh, using this fabric uh, helps prevent that and provide a foundation for the rock seal. And my final slide is, is a slide, and, and this was, a, this was an, an offshore seal project, and this is something that I don't want to see as a field representative when I come on there to monitor the work being done. And, and the issue, this, this uh, riprap material uh, being used to construct a seal was being moved to the seal location by barge. And, and the problem is that there was some shallow water in here, and, and this equipment here, this excavator, didn't have the reach to reach from an upland location to place the, the seal material on the barge. And so what he did was is he, built, he built a platform out here to, to set the machine on, and then the dump trucks and 18-wheelers that were delivering the rock to the site were physically dumping the stockpile in the water. And uh, anyway, uh, we had to get it stopped. We did. And uh, the whole problem was solved when the, uh, once this was removed, they, they, they rented a long reach excavator and sat here and were able to reach and, and place the, uh, place the uh, riprap material on the barge from, the, uh, from a, an upland stockpile site. Using oyster shells and living shoreline designs is common, but will only work in coastal waters where oysters are present. Lexia Weaver with the North Carolina Coastal Federation shares her experience working with oyster shells. So what are recycled oyster shells? They are the shells of oysters that have been harvested and that are consumed by people. Who likes oysters here? Lots of people. I don't like oysters, but lots of people like oysters. So oysters have two shells. There are bivalves. So once you eat the animal inside, the shells are discarded. And we hope that people know to put those shells back into the water. Um, we want them to go and be recycled. Um, and the reason why we do that is because we want them to create new oyster habitat. The oyster larvae that are floating in the water will attach to those oyster shells and create new oysters. It's great fish habitat. And it, once you get your oyster reef established, um, it's also good for the water quality of the estuaries. <clears throat> so there's different ways that you can use oyster shells for uh, living shorelines. You can put them loosely in front of a marsh, like you can put them a little bit offshore and create what uh, we call patch oyster reefs, but also the Division of Marine Fisheries Culture Planting Program also is similar to cr uh, creating these loose patch oyster reefs. Um, you can bag them, and I brought a little, this is a mini bag, a little demonstration bag. Um, you can bag them and then put them right up against the marsh as a marsh tow revetment or as an oyster shell bag sill offshore. You can also do a combination of these methods where you have 
uh, your patch oyster reefs offshore, you can have a sill here, you can have your marsh grass plantings here, maybe you have a, a marsh toad revetment on this side, on um, some other type of, of erosion. But the reason why I'm showing this slide too is that when you have your shoreline, you want to have a master plan for it. Um, you want to kind of plan ahead, and this is lessons learned, um, instead of you know, trying a technique, oh, it worked, let me try and do it over here because of permitting. Basically, you want to apply for just one permit, show them what you want to do uh, one time. And so I'm going to go over the construction of the patch oyster reefs, and then the oyster shell bag revetments, and then the oyster shell bag sills. So for the patch oyster reef construction, typically what is done, this is just one way it can be done, is the oyster shells are delivered, they are placed on dump trucks, um, I mean, I'm sorry, on a barge from dump trucks, and a front end loader is also loaded on the barge, and they use this, the front end loader scoop to basically um, dump the shells into the water, and this does require a major camel permit. So there's many ways that this can be done. Again, great market for you contractors out there. Um, I can. Yes, definitely guarantee that you will get work doing this. Um, these patch reefs, they don't work in every location. If it's a really high energy site where there's a lot of sediment moving around and you risk getting them buried, you may not want to use this approach. Um, you also have the issue of the boring sponge. The boring sponge basically does that. They bore into the shells, so you don't want to put them in areas where the boring sponge is prevalent, typically higher salinity areas because will, it will collapse your reef over time. Um, so that's one thing to keep in mind. <clears throat> so this is just a, an example of some of the designs that I submitted with the major camera applications just so you can see what um, kinds of things they expect. Uh, this was for the ones that we did at Jones Island. They were four, five staggered patch reefs and it just kind of shows you how um, high you're going to make them, how far apart from each other. Um, you can also do one continuous layer of, of loose oyster shells, but it has been shown that that doesn't yield as much habitat. It does the same for shoreline protection, but it doesn't yield as much habitat for fish, crabs, and, and oysters as doing them staggered that way. <clears throat> so for the marsh shore revetments and the oyster shell bag seals, the reason why we bag them is, and you've heard this today, is to keep them where we want to put them. We don't want them to scatter like the patch reefs can do um, naturally. So that's the reason why we bag these oyster shells. Um, I get a lot of questions about the plastic. Why are you putting this plastic in the water? It's kind of, you know, defeating the purpose of, you know, with marine pollution and everything. But what happens is that this plastic, eventually the oysters are going to attach here. And you want to put these in areas where you have a lot of oyster recruitment. Um, that's really important so that you don't waste this valuable resource. Um, so eventually it'll be covered, and I have some photos of that I'll show you as well, where you won't even see the bags anymore. So it kind of works as the glue to hold the reef together. Um, <coughs> so to make the oyster bags, um, we use volunteers, but also, again, this can be done by contractors. We've hired fishermen to make these before, paying them $5 a bag. Um, so it is an industry, I think. It is a good way um, to make some money. Um, so what you do is you use this mesh and you're going to put it over your PVC tube like that, like a sock. I'm using your table here. Um, and then you put that PVC tube in this specially designed bagging frames. Um, these take about $100 to make with your wood, the PVC. The oyster bag mesh is about $125 per roll. And I think it's for 300 feet of mesh, something like that. So you can make quite a few bags for each roll, about $125. Um, and then you fill your uh, tube with the oyster shells. And once they're full, you can either use shovels, you can use scoops, buckets. You pull out the PVC tube. And what you're left with, with the weight of the oyster shells, is are your oysters. And then you just tie the other end. So pretty easy. <clears throat> so um, we've also talked about using marl today. Um, sometimes we did use marl as that sacrificial bottom layer of these oyster, sh oyster shells because we didn't want to waste the valuable recycled oyster shell. The drawback is it's really hard to work with it with volunteers and kids because it is five times heavier. Um, and not to mention because it's rock and um, heavier, the plastic can, you get start getting holes in your bags and the, the rocks fall all over the place. So, Again, contractor work based, I would recommend it for more um, contractors. <clears throat> um, so I'm going to move on to the, these um, marsh toe revetments first. Um, and these are just some ideal candidates of, of eroding marshes for marsh toe revetments. Um, they have the characteristic um, escarpment. 
So basically you would put your bags here. Most of these photos were taken, these three were taken at Beacon Island in, at, near Ocracoke and this one was taken at Jones Island. <clears throat> so basically you call your uh, field rep, 808 to 808 here in Moorhead City, and they come out and they um, you know, tell you whether it's feasible to use these bags on the shoreline. Um, and then you notify your property owners. This can, is done under a general permit. Um, you can go up to 500 feet long for your shoreline. Um, the bags cannot be higher than three feet, and they can't be six inches above the um, height of your marsh soil. Um, this is the plan view where you just indicate to them the yellow line is where I want to put my revetment. This I'm um, going to make it 80-some um, feet, I think this one was. Um, and how you're going to build them. And usually these, for both oyster sills and marsh shore revetments, we put them, um, normally they're more rectangular. We put them perpendicular to shoreline. We don't put them parallel to prevent them from rolling. By putting them perpendicular, that kind of prevents that. Um, and the ones that we've done at Jones Island and, and so far Beacon Island, I mean, they've done great. They've, they've survived all these storms that we've had, and they, ha they have not moved. I mean, occasionally you get one or two bags that you need to replace, but for the most part, at least the ones that I've worked on, they, they've done really well. Um, th and then you submit your cross section, which just your sideways view of how you're going to put the bags. Perpendicular shoreline, we usually do three, four layers high um, and three bags out. <clears throat> this is what your general permit looks like, um, some of the permit conditions that we already talked about. And this is, shows some photos of how we built them. Again, we use um, a lot of volunteers. Um, but you basically start with your first layer, and then you build up from that. Um, and eventually, you, this had a little um, curve in here, so you just follow the shoreline um, with your bags. And then for the sills, this is um, what you would submit. Uh, for our oyster shell bag sills, um, we have mostly done them with CAMA major permits um, because they're, they were offshore. And at the time when we were making these, the oyster shells weren't um, considered an acceptable material. Now they, they are for most reasons and in, at most locations. Um, but this is typically the, the cross-section view that I submitted with that, that permit application. This is how um, we use that, that first sacrificial layer of marl, and then you build up on that marl. So that's what the first layer would look like. And this is my attempt at a hand drawing. That's why I always use the computer. I'm not an artist. I can't draw very well. Um, so yeah, one of the camo field reps taught me how to make that. So th they will help you with your plants. Um, this is uh, an oyster shellback seal that we built at Jones Island. Um, it was built in a day. It was 150 feet long. We had about 65 volunteers. Paul remembers that day. Um, they were recruited by Public Radio East. Um, a lot of them were Marines, which helped a lot. Um, and we built that in one day. Um, these oyster bags are going to serve as a hard surface for that naturally occurring larvae to attach to. Um, over time, this is what um, the reef looks, uh, the oyster sill looks like. All those oysters are going to um, recruit onto the oyster sills and eventually you don't even see those bags in those pictures. This is probably about a year after they're put in, so you kind of start seeing your juvenile oysters in there. <coughs> and it's also great habitat. You see some uh, fish and some hermit crabs, um, so it's really great habitat. Springer's Point on Ocracoke Island was being stabilized with broken concrete that contained rebar and other metal pieces. While it was keeping the shoreline intact, it was a hazard to visitors. The North Carolina Coastal Federation reconfigured the placement of some of the concrete pieces and placed oyster shell bags on top to create a more natural shoreline while still controlling erosion. Aaron Fleckenstein shares a lesson learned from this living shoreline project. And then we had a couple of nor'easters, a series of nor'easters during the winter. And you can see here in the foreground that a lot of these bags started to break open. So the lesson we learned was that even though these, these oyster bags chink together really well, kind of like Legos, when, they're, you know, integ when they have their integrity, when you place them on top of the, the loose rock, and this was also a lesson learned down in the Wilmington area, but, um, when you place those oyster bags on top of that, that granite or that loose rock, it's kind of like a table. It doesn't really, it's not a Lego that is able to chink to the rock. So those, those oyster bags kind of slide on top of the rock, and as they slide with the wave energy, they break open, and you get shell moving across, the, um, across your area, which you don't really want. And so this was an unfortunate thing, 
we thought that maybe if we rebagged it and had a good growing year and no storms, that maybe the bags would hold up. So we did it again. And the bags broke open again. So lesson learned. Please don't repeat our mistake. Marsh plantings play a significant role in the success of a living shoreline project. Lexia Weaver shares her experiences and best practices for working with marsh plants in higher salinity estuaries. That is, those estuaries where the salinity range is 35 parts per thousand or seawater down to 5 parts per thousand or slightly brackish. So basically the, the three types of marsh plant species that you're going to plant for a living shoreline are mostly Spartina alterniflora or smooth gourd grass, Spartina patens, also known as spar, uh, salt meadow hay, and the Juncus Marianus, the black needle rush. And mostly um, what you're going to be planting is the Spartina alterniflora. <clears throat> so I'm going to show you where these um, grow relative to the high tide line and relative to the water. Um, the Spartina alterniflora grows closer to the water below the high tide line, which is indicated by this rack line here, and then you can see the salt meadow hay growing um, behind it. You also see the black needle rush interspersed with the Spartina patents um, up in the higher marsh. So uh, the first thing you need to do to plant your salt marshes is you need to order them. And I always so you need to order them from nurseries. And you do this in the fall, probably around September, October, so that the nurseries know that you're going to require a lot of marsh plants. Um, they go out into the field, into natural marshes, and they harvest the seeds from the smooth cord grass um, during this time. Then they keep them in the winter in paper towels in a refrigerator over the winter. And then in about February, they sow them in these trays in soil. Um, and put them in a greenhouse. And then about April or May, they are ready to plant, which is when you want to plant your marsh grass. You don't want to do it at any other times of year. They won't make it as well. This is the ideal time to plant because that way you capture the growing season of the uh, smooth cord grass. Today, um, it does take a few years for your marsh grass to get established. Um, so you will want to plant every spring for about two to three years. Um, that is an ideal situation. Sometimes your marsh will take off in the first year, and I'll show you some pictures of that, but sometimes in some other sites they'll take a little bit more. When so where do you plant them along a shoreline? Um, so let's say you have an area where there's no other marsh grass species pregnant. So how, uh, there, present. How would I know where to plant them? So I would follow the high tide line, which it's kind of right there, but I really would say right about here because it looks like the tide was up through there. That sand still looks moist. So I would plant my smooth cord grass from here down. You also want to be careful not to plant them too far into the water. They're an intertidal species, so you don't want them submerged at, at, at high tide at all times and even at low tide. So there is that sweet spot where you want to plant them. And then you would put your um, salt meadow hay and your black needle rush above the high tide line. So if you have a shoreline that has existing grass, and we, we talked about this today as well, you want to plant in the area where that grass is already growing, where that species is growing, because you know they're going to do well there. So that makes it easy when there's actually growth there already. <clears throat> so let's say you have 300 marsh, pl marsh plugs to plant, which seems like a lot, but really when you put them out here, um, it's not when you, you consider you know, an extensive salt marsh grass. So where would you want to put them? Do you want to put them over here, or do you want to cover your entire shoreline? What does everybody think? So you would want to put them closer to the existing marsh and closer together. We found that they do a lot better when we do that. Even though you don't cover your entire shoreline, um, maybe you can come back the following year and keep planting and keep planting and keep planting. When we plant them so far apart, they do not do well at all. It's kind of like a safety and numbers thing. Um, there are some scientists from Duke University that are doing some studies on why this is the case, and they're looking at the redox potential, and it has to do with the aeration and the oxygen of each plant giving each other and helping each other out to survive. Um, so that's something that we've learned through the years. We used to plant them about two feet apart. Now we're planting them a lot closer, six inches to a, even a foot apart. So close together and close to existing grass. Um, and when you put your plant in, you are going to want to put the plant in very far. It's okay to put some of the green part under, under the um, sediment. You want to get them in there really deep because when that high tide comes in, you don't want them to wash away your 50, 75 cent plugs that you just paid for. 
Um, so again, very deep. Um, fertilizer is optional. Um, a, a lot of folks like to use it. We use it sometimes, sometimes we don't need to use it. Um, it just depends. If you have a more sandier soil, I would recommend using it. it it's definitely not going to hurt. It is going to help um, promote the growth of your plants. Um, in more marshier, mucky, muddy soils, you may not need it as much. Um, and you just get basically some Osmocote. They come in little pellets, and you put a little bit of pellets in each hole. Um, we also do one plug per hole. Um, a lot of kids cheat that we are volunteers, and sometimes I pull out 20 plugs in each hole. Um, but it works better if you, and maybe I should experiment with that, but um, it works better when you put one plug per hole. Um, this is a picture of my son. He was four years old, um, so I'm teaching him early to plant marsh grass. And it just shows how you can plant at high tide. You basically create your hole, and then you want to work with a partner because you want that person to have your plug ready to go, put it in the ground before the hole closes up. And it creates a very good suction, and your plant is actually in the, at high tide, plant it a little bit better. And the way you test it is you just give it a little tug, make sure that your plants are in there, whether you're planting at high tide or low tide. <clears throat> so this just shows that people of all ages can do this, and there is a market for this. I get a lot of phone calls um, from people wanting to help stabilize their shoreline. Um, this could be a business. You could go into the business of planting marsh grass. Um, again, I, I really do think there is a market for this um, for you contractors out there. <clears throat> So I'm just going to show you some before and after photos of showing how successful these plantings have been. Um, these photos were taken at Jones Island in the White Oak River. Um, it's part of Hammocks Beach State Park where Paul works. Um, and you can see this, this shoreline actually only took one year of planting. So we just planted it once. Um, part of the reason um, why it did so well is that we did put in 9,000 plugs in about 250 linear feet of shoreline. So we did plant it very densely. Um, so that's one of the reasons why it, it, it did so much better. Um, and this one, actually, we planted even, uh, there was a sill that we put in afterwards, so it was even planted without a sill being in there. So it's a good, good success story. <clears throat> this is on the other side of the island, and this um, marsh took a little bit longer to establish. It was a wider area, so instead of about 30 feet that we planted, this one was about 80 feet wide. Um, so that's what it looked like before, after about three years, and then what it looks like today. Um, so it did, did take a little while, so you just need to be patient. It is critical to match your plant species to the long-term salinity of your location. As Alexia mentioned, salt marsh cordgrass, salt meadow hay, and black needle rush work well for higher salinity marshes with salinities between 35 and 5 parts per thousand. For brackish marshes with a salinity of 5 parts per thousand or less, and freshwater marshes, Choose a different group of plants for your living shoreline. These plants include bitter panicum, switchgrass, and water millet. Ensuring your plantings are at the correct water level is also critical, especially in areas with wind-driven tides. Marsh plants can easily grow in drier conditions than they are adapted to. However, they cannot grow in wetter conditions for more than a few days at a time. For a list of plants suited for shorelines with lower salinities, see the handout titled Plants for Living Shorelines in the Carolinas and Virginia. That was developed by Wetland Plants Incorporated located in Edenton, North Carolina. But how well do living shorelines protect and enhance habitat, hold up to hurricanes, and prevent erosion? Dr. Carolyn Curran shares research findings that help answer these questions. First talk a little about fish habitat comparison of um, living shorelines and um, hardened structures. And this is um, a lot of, this is Rachel's dissertation research. She's had several publications, been really um, powerful demonstration of how effective these living shorelines are at providing fish habitat. So as I mentioned, there was the nice picture, then we put in the bulkhead, we lose all, those ha we lose all that habitat, and we found clearly that we don't get as many fish. When we don't have vegetation, we don't have structure, we don't have oyster reefs, you don't have as many fish offshore of a bulkhead system or on a flat bare sediment system as you do when you have marsh oysters SAV. When you get the SAV back into the system and or um, even the oysters or the, the rock sills and then the marsh behind it, Rachel found as many fish 
um, as diverse or in some way times more diversity in the living shorelines than the natural shorelines. So we found very quickly within a year or two, as soon as you get the marsh established, you get a, a restoration of that fish habitat function with the living shoreline, whether you have oyster or whether you have rock. So Rachel's research showed that living shorelines can actually provide um, much better habitat for fish and, and crustaceans than a bulkheaded shoreline. And that's been clear here with bulkheads, and it's been demonstrated in Chesapeake Bay and other places for riprap revetments as well. We've also found that sills can function similar to oyster reefs in terms of providing habitat for fish. So the rock sill is a hard substrate. A lot of times it's colonized by oysters, especially the granite and marl shells. Ew. The oysters will settle out on those, on those sills and actually become part reef, part stone sill. We've also found that it's really important to have that marsh, plant, that marsh planting behind the sill. You can't just have the reef, you can't just have the marsh sill and get that fish habitat benefit. You have to have that marsh community associated with the sill to provide the same fish habitat value function. So what about erosion protection? Are these things going to work? So this is a picture of Hurricane Irene landing on our shore in 2011. And Rachel did a couple things. Rachel looked here in, um, in uh, Bogue Sound and also up in the northern part of the state. And, again, and so what Rachel went and fortunately had data at some of these sites before the hurricane came and then visited them after the hurricane. And this is a picture from Bogue Sound where there was properties that were very near one another. I think there's a lot in between. And this was a bulkheaded site. And then two lots away was someone that had just put in this living shoreline. You can see here a rock sill, and they had just planted the marsh. This is pre-storm. This is post-storm. The water level got up over the bulkhead, scoured behind it, completely removed the bulkhead. Meanwhile, even this very, fairly new, not quite established marsh and sill came through it just fine, no damage at all. Living shorelines are effective at controlling erosion and are a habitat-friendly alternative to bulkheads and other vertical erosion control measures. To view complete presentations from the experts featured in this video, visit the North Carolina Coastal Reserve's YouTube channel.